welcome to this time together in God's presence. And I light this peace candle, and I pray that the peace of God would be known within our hearts, within this community, and that the peace of God would be known within this world. We are a people on a journey, a journey of faith and hope in God's love. Come, let us continue on this journey, keeping our sights on the promises of God's grace. The invitation has been sent to each of us, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey. We are all invited to join in following. We are invited to follow the Christ wherever we are led, to follow into service, into contemplation, into worship, into fellowship with God and God's people and God's created world. Come, let us journey on. Let us recognize ourselves as one family of God as we journey together toward peace and justice. God unites us and journeys with us all the way. And speaking of, of journeys, this week we've had the excitement of celebrating Jean Knapp's 100th birthday. And Jean Knapp went on a bit of a journey around town um, yesterday, which would have been Wednesday. And it was ever so exciting to see, to see Jean. And we wish her a very happy, happy 100th birthday. Let's pray. God, you are God forever. This alone is cause for celebration. But we also know that we are your people. As we feel your love washing over us now, may we love you with every part of our being, heart, mind, body, and soul. We celebrate your love in our lives, and we ask for your help as we try our best to boldly share the good news of your love with others. Amen. And we join in singing Spirit of the Living God. <clears throat> portion of Psalm 90, which is a prayer of Moses. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning, it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening, it fades and withers. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper 
the work of our hands. see each one of your faces. So take a minute to imagine the other kids in Sunday school. Imagine sitting here together. Hopefully before too long we'll be able to see each other in person, but for now let's just be aware of being together in our hearts. In the good old days, like a year ago, when school was normal, you all sat in classrooms, not wearing masks, working in groups, sometimes relaxing, sometimes focusing on your work, just having normal times. I know it's pretty different now, but I'd like you to remember a year ago. Put yourself in your mind back into the way things were October of last year, in your school, with your teacher and your classmates. Now there was a boy, I'll call him Joe, because I don't remember his real name, maybe it was Joe. He's grown up now, but a while ago I heard him on the radio telling a story about when he was in grade five. Joe is an indigenous fellow, and at his school on this particular day, all of the kids in his class were acting up. Erasers were flying, kids were laughing, and the teacher could not get the kids to settle down. All of a sudden, Joe heard her say his name and call him out into the hall. Joe hadn't been doing anything worse than anybody else, so he wondered why she'd picked him out. Uh-oh. He was expecting a lecture or something worse. When they got to the hall, she shut the door and then said something that surprised him. Joe, you are a natural leader. I notice that when you act up, the other kids follow. And when you focus and behave, the other kids follow. And so I want you to go back into the classroom, sit down, Open your book, pick up your pencil, and do your math work. And you might notice what happens. And so Joe did that. And he was amazed. As he got his work going, the classroom quieted down, and everybody started to work. That was a day when those kids learned math. But Joe learned something much more important. He learned that he is a leader. It was about 15 years later when I heard him. By this time, he was in his 20s and working as a youth leader in his community, helping to make his people's lives better. What qualities do you think it takes to make a good leader? Think of people you know, maybe some of the other kids in your class or on a sports team with you, maybe some of the people here in this church, in our town, maybe some leaders who you see on television. A good leader cares about the good of other people. A good leader notices when other people need help and that leader doesn't just get busy and help, but better still, a good leader gathers other people around into a team, and together they make things better. The last few Sundays, we've been talking about one of the most well-known leaders in the story of God's people, Moses. Moses, if you remember, helped the people who were slaves in Egypt to get free. He had seen their suffering, and with God's help, he imagined how things could be better for them. And often, that's what happens with leaders. They see a problem, and they have an idea, a vision, 
of things being better, and they get to work to make that happen. Today, we're hearing the end of the story of Moses. He and the people had had an amazing adventure. See if you can remember the story by looking at the pictures that follow. What's this picture about? It shows Moses leading the people as they traveled for years and years, 40 years, through the desert, through the wilderness, on their way from slavery to freedom. What about this picture? Right. When the people were hungry, God sent manna and quail each day for them to gather and eat. We can think of them when we pray the Lord's Prayer and say the words, give us this day our daily bread. This picture? Right. It's Moses getting water for the people so that they could drink. What about this one? Moses talking with God. All the way on that 40-year journey, as the people walked and sometimes complained and sometimes were happy, Moses often talked to God about what was going on. And God and he figured out solutions to problems, and God watched over them and helped them. And this picture? Yes, when the people were frustrated and not getting along, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments as a guide for the people to live more peacefully and happily together. And now we come to today's reading from Deuteronomy. Finally, after all these years of travel, they were on the edge of a new land and a new life. If you've ever moved house, you may have a little sense a little tiny sense of what they were feeling, getting ready for the anticipation of what was going to happen next. As they made camp for the night, they shared stories of the journey they'd been on. They remembered all that they had been through, good and bad, and they were excited about going into the land that would be their new home. Before the night sky filled with stars, Moses knew that God was waiting to talk to him yet again. And so Moses went and talked with God. God told Moses to look all around at the new land, because Moses at this point was up on a mountain, he could see far. Look all around at the new land that was going to be the land of the people of Israel. It looked like a wonderful place to begin a new life. But God told Moses that he would not be going into that new land with the people. Someone else was going to lead them. So at 120 years old, Moses died in the land of Moab. The people cried for their leader and friend. They remember how Moses had met and talked with God. They remembered how Moses had helped them and led them. For 30 days, they thought about Moses and were sad and remembered. And they wondered who was going to lead them now. At the end of 30 days, Joshua stood before the people. Moses had chosen Joshua to lead the people, and he had prepared him and blessed him. The people were happy. They knew there would never be another leader like Moses, but they were ready to trust and follow Joshua into the new land and the new life. The story of Moses tells us about what happened to the people a long time ago when they were traveling from slavery into freedom. But it's not just a story about back then. It's a story about what can happen for us as we travel to our new life and freedom. It's a story about our connection with God and with each other. Down through the ages, God has loved our people, 
and it's now our turn to receive and share that love. So for an activity today, I invite you to get a piece of paper and just write two things down on it. It's very short, it's easy to remember. Put down number one, I love. And number two, others love me. And tonight, put that piece of paper beside your bed. And tonight, when you go to bed, take some time, to, if you want to close your eyes or leave them open, whatever, but take some time to look back over today and think of some time when, for the I love one, when you loved someone else. Maybe you phoned your grandparents to say hi. Maybe you did something kind, unexpected for someone. And then for the other one, I am loved, think of some time today when someone did something nice for you. It could be as simple as someone smiling at you. Or maybe tonight your parents will make a special dessert for, for dinner. And enjoy thinking about those moments of sharing love. When we are aware of receiving and sharing love, we see how, like Moses, we are part of the story of God's love. And now, let's together sing Draw the Circle Wide, a song about loving everyone. This morning's scripture is Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. And there's two sections. The first one is the greatest commandment. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart 
and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And then the question about David's son. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to me, sit on my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus call him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This week I watched a short video about archery and the video begins with a person gently tossing a six inch wooden disc into the air and seconds later an arrow speeds its way into the face of the disc. A high-speed camera replayed in slow motion captures the arrow's impact nearly in the center of the disc. The next target is a two and a half inch plastic ball. Again, a person tosses the ball into the air. Again, the arrow launches toward its target and hits it nearly in the center. 
the archer's, archer's arrow flies three more times, each time into the center of an even smaller target, a golf ball, a lifesaver, an aspirin. In each case, the arrow goes straight to the mark, even when the target is no larger than the diameter of the arrow itself. The accuracy of this archer was astounding to me, considering I can barely park my car between the yellow lines of my designated parking spot using a backup camera. <laughs> when the show's host asks how it is possible to shoot an arrow so accurately using a handmade bow, especially when the target seems so small, the archer replies, the center of an aspirin is exactly the same size as the center of a beach ball. Always aim for the center. In today's reading that Ian read for us from Matthew's Gospel, a scribe says to Jesus, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? When Jesus responds to the question, he aims for the center straight into the heart of their shared sacred scriptures. Jesus quotes Shema, the prayer that is central to Jewish identity. Shema Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And he combines a portion of Deuteronomy with Leviticus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Within the Jewish understanding, Marcus Borg writes, the character of the heart depended upon its orientation, what it was pointed toward or centered in. What mattered was the orientation of the self at its deepest level, its center or fundamental loyalty. Jesus was a radical, Borg says, in teaching that we are to be centered in the spirit and not on the many other things that call for our loyalties. Loving God. Loving God with your heart means bringing everything to God. It's not, as someone said, a partial invitation. Love God most of the time. Love some of your neighbors. Be loving toward yourself once in a while. This invitation calls for the whole of who we are to be focused on loving God, and for that love to be expressed in our relationships with others. Here are some of the examples of what the Bible has to say about what the heart is and what it does. Trust in the Lord with your whole heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. For the first century listeners, Jesus probably could have stopped with, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Because what follows, soul and mind and strength, are implied by the biblical understanding of heart. New Testament scholar Thomas Hare, when commenting on Matthew 22, said, said the following, it is important to remember that the primary component of biblical love is commitment. Deuteronomy 6 demands of us an unwavering commitment to love the neighbor is to imitate God by taking their needs seriously. Jesus taught his disciples 
his way of love. He encouraged the disciples with his wisdom. He spoke through his actions and words of love and peace and justice. I pray that love will free us from prejudice, from racism, from fear of the other. I pray that love will free us to care for others with a deep and abiding respect. Strengthened by God's giving of God's heart to us, we can give ours to our neighbors. One suggestion regarding this reading from Matthew's Gospel is to imagine the words God, self, and others as words on a separate pieces, on separate pieces of a mobile, held in balance and tension. Jesus, in the way he gives these commandments, implies that none is more or less important than the other. To live a life of faith, we need to keep these important aspects of our lives in balance. When we do that, may we hear Christ say to us, you are not far from the reign of God. Let us remember. Let us remember God's love which guides and sustains us and empowers us to work for peace and justice in our own time. We have this assurance. We have this ever-abiding assurance that God is with us. We are not alone. And thanks be to God. And I share with you a sonnet of the star and ship by Andrew King. The soul stands on deck, rain-soaked in the storm, wind-lashed, anxiously watching the dark sky. It's seeking safe harbor, calmer seas, warmer bays. It needs something to navigate by, some star to break through the clouds, show the way home. It has tried this long voyage alone, but weary with the bleak night, longs for day. Suddenly, clouds break, and there in the zone that shines a bright star, it is love, the command to love God, to love neighbor, Christ showing the way. It is what guides the soul to good land, its true home. Now see the star lowering, becoming ship, becoming sail, both goal and means. Yes, love leads and carries, makes whole. Let us affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us come before God in prayer. Faithful God, we do not have enough words to thank you for all you have given us and the love you share with us in Jesus. In the silence of this time, help us review the week just past, remembering the ways we encountered you, 
in the beauty of creation, the support of friends, the wisdom of books, the joy of music, the energy of exercise through study and prayer. God of comfort and challenge, we are grateful for your presence in these uncertain times at home, at work, at school. We give you thanks for your attention to the small details and the large responsibilities we face. Be with us as the pandemic continues. Give us patience to keep each other safe and make us attentive to the needs of those around us. In silence, we name before those, you, those who are finding these days especially difficult. We pray for places where justice is lacking, where violence threatens. Strengthen voices of wisdom and acts of courage, courageous compassion to tend the needs of people most at risk. We pray that our love for you, O God, continues to be tangible in our love of our neighbor. And may that love be forgiving and generous and gentle like Jesus' love, that we may recognize and welcome him in our brothers and sisters. God of grace and guidance, you call us to be your hands and feet, your voice and comfort in the world. Equip us to respond to the needs around us in Jesus' name. And we pray together in the way that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We join in singing Yezu, Yezu. Thank you. 
blessing entitled Love is the Most Ancient Law, written by Jan Richardson. Open to it, and you will know how love is its own blessing and most ancient of laws. Pursue it entirely with everything in you, your heart, all, your soul, all, your mind, all. Spend it all, this love so generous, this love that goes out to each, to each it finds, this love that gives itself in lavish and unimagined measure everywhere and to all, yourself not least. May God's love surround you, uphold you, and empower you to be agents of love in this world. And now may the peace of Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore.